Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1547. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Hello, inspiring automotive enthusiasts, and welcome to Cars Yeah. I'm very revved up and very excited to share with you a very special guest calling in from Melbourne, Australia, Ian Falloon. Ian Falloon was born in New Zealand and studied engineering and music at Victoria University in Wellington after a motorcycle accident brought an end to his career as a symphony orchestra oboist. He began writing articles about motorcycles for magazines and then books. His first book, The Ducati Story, has run to several editions and has been published in three languages. The success of that book led to a series of Ducati books and histories of Honda, BMW, Moto Guzzi, and Via Gusta, and numerous other motorcycle marks. Ian's newest book, which we'll be talking about today, is the complete book of BMW motorcycles, every model since 1923. It's published by my good friends at the Quarto Group. And by the way, one lucky Cars Yes subscriber is going to win a copy of this very cool book compliments the Quarto Group. If you just go to CarsYeah.com and click on the free book button, your name will be in the hat. And if you're already a Cars yes subscriber, don't worry, your name's in that very same hat. We'll be giving one of those away in about a week. I'll be back in a minute to talk with Ian, but first a word from our valued sponsors that make Cars yeah possible. We'll be right back. What your vehicle's worst enemy? No, it's not that bird that sits on that branch just above your car waiting for his chance. It's the sun. But don't worry, Covercraft has you covered. Their sunscreens are a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to protect your dash from the sun's harmful UV rays. And they keep the interior of your vehicle way cool. Covercraft makes a wide variety of custom-fit sunscreens for almost any car that exists. They offer a wide variety of custom-fit sunscreens in a variety of colors as well for you to choose from. They're fast, easy to use, they fold up quick, and they store under or behind your seat and take about five seconds to install or remove. I have a Covercraft sunscreen in all of my vehicles, and you should too. And I've got a deal for you. Order online at Covercraft.com and use the code YA120 and get 10% off your order. That's code YA120, Y-E-A-H-120 at Covercraft.com. They've got you covered. My favorite collector car magazine is Keith Martin's Sports Car Market. I've been a subscriber for decades. Sports Car Market is the Wall Street Journal for enthusiasts and collectors. It's your monthly must-read whether you dream of owning a collector car or if you have 200 in your garage. Sports Car Market has been around for 31 years and it's filled with valuable articles, intelligent write-ups, and the latest auction sales. Go to sportscarmarket.com and subscribe today. Plus, you'll get an exclusive SCM Guide to Restoration Shops included for free. And I've got a couple very cool offers. One is if you go and subscribe to their digital subscription, you're going to get 50% off using the code Cars. Yeah, that's right. 50% off their digital subscription. But wait, that's not all. If you go and subscribe and get their print magazine and use the code BSH, you get $10 off. That's right. $10 off. Why BSH? Well, that's the Buy, Sell, Hold podcast that I do every Tuesday with Keith Martin. You'll find it here on the Cars yeah! website or using your mobile device with any mobile device podcast app, or you can find it at sportscarmarket.com. That's Buy, Sell, Hold, the essence of collecting. Hey, Ian, welcome to Cars Yeah. I usually ask my guests if they're buckled up and ready for a fun ride, but in the case of a motorcycle guy like you, do you have your helmet on, your gloves, your boots? Are you ready for a ride? Yes, I am. All right. Great to have you here, and I appreciate you calling in from, well, you're the winner today from the furthest away from where I am on the other side of the planet. I always find it interesting when a guest calls in from Australia because it's already tomorrow, and I just want to so badly ask them what the winning lottery numbers are. But somebody told me that doesn't work that way, so uh, I guess I won't bother you with that. Before we start talking about you and this new book that you've done, which I love. This book is so cool. What's one little thing that most people don't know about you, Ian? Most people actually don't know I live in Australia because all my publishing is in the, the US and the UK. So um, 
I think that's probably probably it. Now, you were born in New Zealand, and what ended up taking you to Australia? Well, I came to Australia to play in a symphony orchestra, and then I never went back after that. So, um, uh, But I, I brought my motorcycles with me, so that's where it all came, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, before we get into some of the questions I have for you today, in the intro we talk about you had this accident, and that really altered your focus in life. And I find it rather interesting. Obviously, you're a motorcycle guy. You brought your motorcycles with you to Australia. But the fact that an accident on a bike then led you to become a rider about bikes. So obviously, no matter how this happened to you and how it altered your course of life, it sounds like you've been a bike guy for a long time. Yeah, I've been a bike guy for 45 years. And it was just a major part of my life, just riding I was riding 50,000 miles a year, touring everywhere and um, on a range of motorcycles, not just when I had a whole whole range of bikes. And um, and then when I had the accident, which was very serious, I just about lost my leg and my arm. Oh. I couldn't ride, I just couldn't ride, physically ride as much as I could before. Mm-hmm. And so I couldn't do a lot of things. So um, I got into write, writing, historical articles initially because I couldn't really do road tests it was yeah so it was I got into the history of motorcycles well for those of us who love bikes we're glad that you did I'm sorry it had to happen the way that it did but this book is so cool and we're going to talk a lot more about it in just a minute but first I want to ask you for a success quote or a mantra, some kind of saying that has meaning for you, something that drives your success. It's a really nice way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars Yeah. So Ian, grab the handlebars and twist the wrist. Well, I didn't set out to be a, a motorcycle writer. It was sort of, that's sort of how it happened. Um, but I just love bikes and it just came, just came from passion and interest. That's how it all, all evolved. And um, uh, I'd say just follow your passions and interests if you want to make it work. Absolutely. Now, I've heard that from so many guests here on the show. And the fact that you've been able to do that is really commendable because a lot of people have passions with cars and bikes and things, but they never find a path that they can create a career around that. And you certainly figured out how to do it. How many books have you written? I've written about 45 books. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it's quite a few. And I guess <clears throat> I've been able to do it because I've just collected information all my life, I've collected motorcycle magazines, documents, brochures, and just yeah, documentation and is, is why I have been able to do it. Well, let's talk a little bit more about this book that you wrote. And the title, again, is The Complete Book of BMW Motorcycles, Every Model Since 1923. And in the preliminary book that uh, the Quarter Group sent me, looking through this, there's a couple of things that really stand out for me. Number one is... I used to ride motorcycles. I've never had a BMW. I had Italian bikes, Ducati Monster, and Via Gusta F4, and I always kind of liked that look. But I always have liked German things because I've always had German cars, Porsches, BMWs, many of those. But there's some bikes in this book that I didn't even know existed. And I also didn't know I had a passion for pre-war BMW motorcycles. They are stunning. They almost look like and you, you might laugh at me at this, but they almost remind me of Italian cafe racers just with their swoopiness and the way that they look. So share with us why you wanted to write this book and maybe some of the things that you discovered while you were writing it. Well, this is not the first book I've done on BMW. So, and it's actually not the first edition of this book either. This is the second edition of this particular book. So I've done several books on BMWs and Actually, I've built up a very good relationship with BMW mobile tradition over the years through through my book, historical books. Mm-hmm. And they were very forthcoming when I did this, when I pr- proposed this book with, for them with um, photographs, archival photographs that have never been published before. So I was very fortunate in this case that they just let me have access to everything. And they've got thousands of photos, like you wouldn't believe, all very well organised. So they let me access their photos, and particularly of the pre-war bikes. Yeah. There's a lot of photos there that have never been seen before. And the pre-war BMWs are the most interesting BMWs of motorcycles because they they were groundbreaking at the time. As you say, stylistically, they were groundbreaking, and technologically, they were groundbreaking. 
And where other manufacturers were struggling to survive, BMW was thriving in the 1930s. As you can see, the, the most collectible BMWs by far are pre-war BMWs, and they are very interesting technologically and stylistically, and they're quite rare too also. So they're, they're sort of a very interesting part of BMW history. Yeah. The thing that struck me with this book was, as you mentioned, the photographs. And lots of times when you see old photographs, they're not very good. Uh, they're not very crisp and clean. They're kind of fuzzy and they're not that great. And they're not, these photographs are stunning. And I love the action shots of guys on bikes racing, the groups of people, the factory shots. They're crisp. They're clear. They're really, really cool. And as I said, I've I've kind of fallen in love with these pre-war BMWs that a lot of them I, I had not known much about. And they're just absolutely beautiful. i uh, yeah, I think my wife might even let me park one in the living room here if I could get my hands on one, but they've probably become quite collectible, haven't they? Yeah, they are. The, the pre-war ones are the most valuable BMWs now. It's, it's absolutely stunning, and I, I think it's pretty cool. Let me ask you this. I always ask my guests about a challenge, and you know, you've written so many books, I, I would think that this has become easy for you, but maybe not. What were some of the challenges that you faced in bringing this book about uh, about again in its second version? And even maybe talking about the first version too. The biggest challenge with a complete book like this, in some ways the earlier history is easier because there were just fewer models. The biggest challenge is the modern bikes in the last 20 years. If you, so if you go back 40 years, BMW had half a dozen models of motorcycle built on one platform. Now they have 10 models built on five platforms. Oh, gosh, yeah. And they change them every four, every four years, the platform changes. So in the era of consumerism now is that the, everything changes more rapidly. And BMW is trying to sell 200,000 motorcycles by 2020. Well, that's not going to happen, obviously, this year, but that was, they're on, that was their plan. In the 1950s and 60s, they, they sold, you know, five to 10,000 bikes a year. So it, it's, the whole thing has changed. BMWs are now a, um, a mainstream manufacturer where in the, in the 1930s and until maybe the 1980s even, they were a, a smaller, much smaller volume, lower volume, and aimed at a different sort of clientele. Mm -hmm. But now they're a mainstream, produce a lot of models over multiple platforms. And as a, to document this is challenging. Um, and especially when you've got a word count limit and a picture limit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's a very challenging situation. So um, so in many respects, writing about the newer bikes is harder than the older ones because it's just got so much more information. And to ch to document the changes from year to year is, you know, it's a lot of work. Well, I can't even imagine. Now, this might be a silly question, but how many bikes, let's say models, has BMW done during its lifetime? Do, do you know what that number is? Oh, no, I wouldn't know. But I know that in the last 20 years, it would have added up to more more than the previous 80 years, you know, so. Wow, yeah. Well, it, it makes sense. Yeah, when you go to a bike store and you see all these different models, it's kind of like with cars. If you think of the Porsche 911, there's so many variations of that car. It's yeah. almost ridiculous. It's like they're trying to appease this wide variety. It's exactly the same. You look at the Porsche 911, you compare the Porsche 911 to 1970, Yes. To what they've got now, and it's exactly the same. There's so many variations. It's the way the the marketing structure works these days. Is that if you want to sell a lot of individual units, the way to sell them is to have multiple variations on a single platform and sell fewer of each type, and it adds up to a lot. And but in the in the 1960s, 70s, that that, that was a, was a different thing altogether. Oh yeah, when I think about 1970, Porsche basically had three models. You know, the, exactly. the T, exactly. the E, and the S, and exactly. you know they they varied those a little bit. You, 73 you could get the marvelous Carrera, of course, but now it's just like I say, it's almost ridiculous. Let me ask you this. We're going to jump into some of your personal loves for bikes, but is BMW one of your favorite marks or do you tend to gravitate towards Italian bikes? I know that you have a love for those. I've owned several BMWs and when I ride, rode a lot, my favorite riding bikes were BMWs. They're bikes, they're not the best bikes to look at, but if you want to go a long distance, 
right. and comfort and carry equipment. They are the best bikes. And, um, and so I've had good experiences on BMW motorcycles, the best experiences of all, actually, in terms of long-distance riding. But now they're not, a, they're not a bike that you want to – they're not a bike for short-duration things that I can – all I can do now. So they're, they're not my personal choice anymore, but I can see why people buy them because they are the perfect long-distance motorcycle. Oh, absolutely. When I was riding bikes, I remember there was a BMW dealership across the street from my office and I went over there and the guy knew me and he said, you know, you got to take one of these touring bikes out just to see what it's like. And yeah. I looked at it, it's this big giant thing. I'm like, oh, why would I want to ride that? And he goes, no, really take it out. And he showed me this road to go on and I took it out and I came back and it was just, it's almost relaxing. It was just so wonderful. And I was shocked at how smooth. So now I see why friends of mine who have those big touring bikes that go long distances and, you know, have their wife on the back or they each have a bike or whatever, uh, why they have a bike like that, because it is so comfortable and all the amenities that they have. It's quite unlike riding an MV Augusta, that's for sure. It, it certainly is. And also they go long mileages. And I've got friends who do 300,000 miles on on our, our series BMs, so they yeah. they last. You know, they're not perfect, but they last a lot longer than most motorcycles. So, oh yeah, um, well, German. You know, that's that's the German the German build. That's what it's all about. Well, let's take a short break. Thank our sponsors, and we'll be right back to talk a little bit more about your passion for bikes. So sit tight. If you're listening to Cars Yeah, you've probably spent some time working on your favorite ride. But how confident are you working on your finances? You may be able to rebuild a fuel injection system, but can you decipher the details of a mutual fund? If you're like me, investments, insurance, annuities, budgeting, and other financial concepts may seem a bit daunting. But what if I told you there's a book that describes these subjects and more in an easy to read and a very humorous way? My friend Chris Kimball, CFP, a longtime sponsor and past guest here on Cars yeah, has written that book and it's titled The Saga of Ike and Penny, a couple's humorous journey through the confusing world of finance. It's a fun look at things you need to know. Everything from investing to effective ways to get rid of credit card debt and it's probably the only book on finance with a VMAX on the front cover and a classic Mini Cooper on the back. The book's available at Amazon for just $10 and this book will dramatically improve the direction of your financial future. I gave copies to each of my children. All securities are through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Christopher Kimball Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Get your copy, The Saga of Ike and Penny, today. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars Yeah website at carsyeah.com. All right, we're back in. Uh, I would love for you to share a story that instigated this passion that you have for motorcycles. Is there a pivotal moment when you go back into your life and you knew that you were going to be a bike guy? Well, it, was, it happened when I was younger. Well, it's a cumulative thing, but I used to see the um, – when I used to take a bus up the hill to university, and this Norton Commando used to overtake the bus every morning. <laughs> and it would just – had a sound – and when it leaned, this guy leaned into this big sweeping corner, you know, these sort of things, they, they last in your brain, you know. So, yes. um, uh, and because of that, I've always had a soft spot for Norton Commandos as well, and I've had a few. Mm -hmm. And it was just the, the leaning, the cranked over through the corner, that's what really got me. Uh, yeah, uh, no yeah. kidding. As a, as a young man, for sure, I mean, you're stuck on a bus with a bunch of other people, and you see that guy carefree flying through the corner. Yeah. Ah, Norton Commando. What a cool bike, too. And you said you've had had Norton Commando? I've had several, actually. Several? Um, okay. Yeah, and I've had, had some good experiences on them and some bad experiences. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> Norton is a bike that it's not a level playing field like a BMW. They're, they're highs and lows. That ah. And, and when, when, when everything's ru running well, they are fantastic. But when things aren't going so well, can cause you so much grief. Yeah. It's all these British cars are much the same, aren't they? So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think so. They all fall in the same category. But um, I once rode my Norton 
it was about an 800 mile ride in a day. It was a long, long ride, but it took me 30 hours because oh my gosh, the, because the exhaust pipes kept vibrating loose, and I just had to stop all the time to tighten up the exhaust pipes, and, I, and it was just drove me nuts and yeah and, uh, yeah so but you know this is what they're like but then other times you go for a ride in the through the mountains and they handle beautifully They've got such a talky motor when it's everything's running well they are fantastic when the exhaust pipes stay on the bike yeah, <laughs> yeah. And, and 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 i think you know i was quite young when i had a norton i don't think they're bikes for young people that don't understand about maintenance maintenance so they're, they're wow. not that sort of bike you know so yeah well, let's talk about the first bike that came into your life that had great meaning. It could be the first bike you got, or it could be a bike you saved up for that you really wanted. What was that bike, your make and model, and then what's a special memory you have about that ride? Well, the first bike I bought was a Ducati 750. Not the ideal learner bike. Yeah, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> but you didn't have to have learner bikes or anything back in the early 70s. And that bike is still the best bike I ever owned, and the Ducati 750 is still my favourite bike, and, and it has been all along, and um, in, in various incarnations. Uh, what year was that? Was that duck? 73. 73. And so I don't have that exact bike, but I still got the same one. I still got several of the same ones, you know. So what happened? I got the 750 GT, then I moved up to the Sport. But I couldn't keep. I couldn't afford to keep every bike, so I had to move the other one on. Then I got Super Sport eventually, and that's the one I still have. Yeah, but I still I have a whole range of 750s. I've bought them over the years. Bought them back. Still, that's my favourite motorcycle. is the 750 GT. Yeah, they're beautiful bikes. Absolutely, to this day. Yeah, the whole line of them is fantastic. Well, here's an interesting question for you, Ian. If you woke up tomorrow and you were a motorcycle. You are actually manifest as a bike, not what you want to be, but how you perceive your characteristics as a motorcycle. What would Ian Falloon be and why? Well, it wouldn't be a modern bike, that's for sure. <laughs> but yeah, well, I, I would pr probably be a, I mean, a, I'd probably be a racing, a, a Ducati NCR racer of you know, 1978. Ah, okay. And, and why is that? I think they're the most beautiful bike ever made, really, the um the NCR, the factory NCR, like Mike Hale would race at the Isle of Man in 1978. I think they are the most beautiful bike. Yeah, yeah. They are super cool. Yeah. For sure. And, and the fairing and just everything about them. I, I got to visit the Ducati factory years ago in Bologna. And, of course, they've got one there and all their other bikes and so forth. But there's something about that bike. I think it's because it seems longer for some reason there's just a look about it maybe the wheelbase is longer because it was designed that way for racing you would know better than me but it, it, it feels stretched out yeah they are a long bike because the seven fit they were based on the 750 mm -hmm. which is a long bike it's just a that's a different era uh, and back in those days the bikes were long they had a long wheelbase for stability they don't need that anymore but back then that was how you got the the, the high speed stability and um those bikes were, were basically modified street bikes, but they were beautifully executed. And I mean, they weren't the fastest or the best bikes of the of the day. The Envy Augusta was a better racing bike, but I, I, I just like that. Yeah, ninety degree V twin, and and that was the that particular bike was a very beautiful thing. You know, so um, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Very cool. Well, we're entering the last lap here. I'm going to fire off a series of questions and ask you to give our listeners some quick blips of that NCR throttle. So here we go. Would yeah. you share one of your personal habits you believe has helped contribute to your success as a writer? I'm obsessed with absorbing information. I've always collected information. So when I write these books like these historical, I've got a massive library of old magazines and brochures and books i've got a huge a huge resource i have my own resource i don't really need outside resources because i've got it all oh my gosh and, wow and and that makes it very very convenient yeah. not easy but it makes it easier to do this sort of detail these, these detailed books that i write absolutely how about if i could arrange for you to have a drink or a meal with anyone in the motorcycle industry or racing industry living or deceased who would it be I was very fortunate to meet Fabio Taglioni several times when wow. he was alive, and I would I would like to meet him again and ask him a whole lot more questions. You know? yeah. So um, yeah, um, he does. He's done all 
the Ducati Center. So that would be marvelous. How about the best motorcycle advice anyone's ever given you? What was it? The best motorcycle advice. Yeah. 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 In terms of buying a motorcycle or? Well, it could be anything. could be in terms of riding, buying, investing, uh, restoring, anything relating to motorcycles that somebody has advised you on that you've remembered and you've, you've used that, that wisdom. Well, I think in terms of motor, uh, using motorcycles, I think that the best advice that I ever had was change the oil regularly. Yeah, maintenance, regular maintenance. Yeah. 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 It's pretty common, but you'd be surprised yeah. how many people don't do that on bikes or cars. They just. I oh, know they don't. They don't. And especially Italian bikes, you know, if you want to keep them going, yeah. you really have to change the oil regularly because they don't have good oil filtration. Um, but they can last a long time if you if you do yeah, that. Yeah, simple maintenance. Yeah. How about yeah. a resource, a go-to for you? I know you have your immense resources there in your home for this, yeah. but is there a resource that you go to regularly? This could be an app, a, a website you like going to, or something you might want to share that has to do with motorcycles. I mean, I have access to all the, the press sites. It's really useful for the modern bikes, you know, having mm -hmm. the press pieces, but... You can spend a lot of time searching through all this stuff. It's all in files and stuff, but it's pretty time consuming. So actually I find that website Total Motorcycle quite useful. Do you know that one? I don't know. I'll have to look that up. Yeah, that's that's a pretty good website for press it's it's basically just press releases, but they're all there in one place. One place. So, okay. Yeah. Total yeah, motorcycle. So, okay, is that totalmotorcycle.com? Yeah. Okay. It's, it's a very and, and it goes back it's not just current ones, it goes back um, in time as well. So wow. you can just select the year you want to, and, and, and all different makes, every different make and every different year. And it's there just immediately. And I find that I've just f finished a book on MV Augusta, every model, of, every model of MV Augusta. And that's been a huge amount of work. And um, their press releases are incomplete, oh. even though I'm. <laughs> yeah. so, but so, so have to, check, to cross check with other other sources has been quite useful. Like, now, that book on Envy Augusta, is that book published now or is it just going no, on? It's, it's, it's been published by Veloce in the UK and it's been delayed because of this virus business. Yeah. So that won't be out to next year now. All yeah, right. So. Well, I'll remind our listeners that I'll put a uh, listing and a way you can get your hands on a copy of the complete book of BMW Motorcycles. Every model since 1923. And I'll ask Ian to let me know when that uh, Envy Augusta book is out. I would love to get my hands on a copy of that as well. They are so beautiful. Is there another book that maybe is a book that you've read that you might recommend that is one you didn't write? If you want to if you just enjoy life with, you know, reading about motorcycles, my friend Peter Egan, mm -hmm. I think his writing is the best for. Um, yes. Uh, his, his columns from Cycle World and, and Road and Track and stuff. I have a copy of his book. Uh, I think it's called Leaning. Leaning, that's right. Yeah, that, yeah. I, I find that his, his writing, is, is I, I think, is the best. Yeah, he's, he's great. All right, Ian, we're up to the checkered flag here, and uh, I'm going to have a little fun today. I'm going to buy you a motorcycle any motorcycle in the world. It could be an old bike. In fact, let's try to make sure it is an old collectible bike, something really fun. But I want it to be something that you would be able to go out and ride and enjoy. I'm not going to allow you to sell it to uh, buy a bunch of other bikes with or anything else. You've got to keep it and it would be part of your collection. But here's the deal. Let's just for today, because I know you're a bike guy and I'm not going to make you get rid of all your bikes, but let's say for today, it's the only one bike that you can have, a bike that ticks all the boxes for you, what would that bike be and why? It would be the um, Ducati 750SS 1974 round case. Ah, uh, you knew right where to go. Yeah. <laughs> That's the one, huh? Well, what is it about that bike you love so much? Well, I think that it's um, it's a race replica, for the first real race replica for the street, built in limited edition. They're the smoothest and the, and the nicest to ride of all those those um mm. Ducati, the bevel Ducatis. Yeah. That they're, they're the lightest and the and the and the nicest and um they're the best looking. But they're also they're quirky. They're like all Italian products of the early seventies. You know, they're flawed. They're flawed but they're beautiful. Do you know what I mean? So <laughs> well, you you like the, the green the green uh style, but I, I know they also the round case was the round case the orange one. Am I mixing it up with the green frame? 
It's the green style one. Yeah, the green frame is the one I'm talking about. Yeah. Yes. Oh, gosh. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's just, that's classic. Yeah. I, why yeah. Why would I be surprised you would pick anything other than that? Because that bike is just, it's beautiful. That, that's that's my favorite bike. So Okay. Um, all right. Well, I'll get to work on that. Uh, it's going to be a little hard for me to ride it all the way there because there's a big ocean between us, but uh, I'll see what I can do. Uh, that would be fun to meet up with you in Australia and go for rides on those bikes. Uh, that would be a lot of fun. I would love to do that. Well, you've taken us on a nice ride today. I'm really happy to to be, been able to meet you thanks to our friends at the Quarto Group and share this new book with my listeners. It's definitely a book that you listeners want to have in your library. And again, one lucky subscriber here at Cars yeah is going to win a copy of this book. All you have to do is go to CarsYeah.com and click on the red free book button. I'll send you my free ebook. It's titled Filler Up. Kind of a fun book that I put together for you guys and you gals, but uh, one lucky subscriber is going to get a copy of this book. So uh, you're going to be very, very thrilled. Before I let you go here, Ian, I've really enjoyed your stories and I really appreciate you taking some time with us today. Is there a little parting piece of wisdom or guidance you might offer us today before you ride off into the sunset in that beautiful 750 SS? I've been very fortunate that my, with motorcycles that I've, I've, been, I've been able to create a career out of it. But it's not just that. The people I meet through this, I've just met such a lot of interesting people and the motorcycle community is a, just a fantastic community. I mean, so great group of guys and gals. Yeah. It, do yeah. you have a website where people can follow along with what you're doing? Or are you active on social media? I have a website, ianfaloon.com. And that's I A N F A L L double O N. That's correct. Ianfaloon.com. I'll make sure I put a link to that on the website so you listeners can follow along with what Ian is doing. I encourage you also to go check out the Quarto Group. Their website, fantastic books. Uh, this book is a keeper. It's a winner. It's something for your uh, library. Even if you're not totally into bikes, you're going to like this book. Or if you have a friend that's into bikes, uh, buy a copy or two and give them away as gifts. It'll put a smile on any motorcycle enthusiast's face. Ian, thanks again for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for calling in to me. Stay healthy, stay well. All you listeners out there, take care of yourselves. This will pass. We're all going to be okay. Hang in there. Until you and I talk again, Ian, I'll see you down the road. Thank you, Mark. It's been a pleasure. Pleasure's all mine. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!